Okay, shall we uh, get started? Good. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us today. My name is Alex Tilson. I am uh, Managing Director of International Business Development at Promonio REM. I'm based in our London office and uh, welcome to our webinar, uh, Insights for Value, and it's our Pan-European Outlook uh, as at June 2023. Um, I'm joined by three speakers today. Uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, Daniel Weil. Daniel is the uh, Head of Research Strategy and ESG at Promonio REM. Uh, Hi, Alex. In Good our to be here. Office. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Uh, and you're going to be taking the first session to talk about uh, real estate's resilience in a challenging context, a macroeconomic point of view. Uh, we're then joined by Henri Aurélien Nater. Good morning, Henri. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Henri is our head of research, again, based in our Paris office. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, we're joined by Jan Balay uh, to talk about healthcare in particular. Good morning, Jan. Good morning, Alex. Thank Good morning, you. everyone. And Jan is our head of healthcare and education. Um, so very quickly before we start, uh, particularly for those who are not familiar with Promenio REM, I'm going to give a very quick uh, introduction to our organization. Uh, so Promenio REM is a pan-European real estate manager, uh, currently managing about 35 billion euros uh, in AUM uh, across several different sectors. Uh, we're headquartered in Paris, but we have offices uh, across Europe. So three offices in Germany, an office in Milan in Italy, uh, in Luxembourg, uh, in London, and also in Singapore. Um, we uh, provide uh, investment solutions for both individual investors and also institutional investors. So within that 35 billion euros, uh, just over half of that AUM uh, is managed on behalf of retail investors. Uh, and uh, just under half, 46% on behalf of institutional investors through a series of uh, fund structures, club deals, joint ventures, uh, and um, you know, various other structures. We have about 400 people uh, in total in the organization, uh, and uh, we have invested across uh, 10 European countries. Uh, that 35 billion uh, AUM roughly represents about 1,500 individual buildings. Um, our portfolio is weighted primarily towards office and uh, healthcare, uh, but we're also very active in residential, uh, in hotels, in retail. Um, we have a small logistics uh, uh, um, exposure as well. Um, in terms of healthcare in particular, and we'll be hearing more about this from Jan later in the session, uh, we have about 11 billion uh, AUM currently. That's set to increase uh, as well over the coming months, um, uh, in particular due to a, a large deal that we're in process with. Um, and Jan will talk a little bit more about that as well uh, during his session. Um, so we're, I believe, the largest um, and, and leading uh, healthcare manager uh, in Europe and set to consolidate that position further. Um, just very briefly to mention, that we're a vertically integrated organization. Uh, we uh, do everything down the stack from fund management, uh, acquisitions, investments, uh, asset management, uh, and also property management as well, um, which we think distinguishes us from some of our peers. Uh, we have individual property management businesses in, uh, in France and Germany. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we also have a dedicated hotels and hospitality division as well. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to Daniel for the first session uh, of today's webinar, uh, Real Estate's Resilience in a Challenging Context uh, Macroeconomic Point of View. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Alex. Uh, oh, actually, Daniel, Daniel, sorry, before you start, the one thing Go I did ahead, want please. to mention, and I should have mentioned at the start, um, is that you know, please do uh, send in questions. Uh, there's a Q&A box on the uh, uh, Teams window. Uh, and I'll do my best to uh, make sure that we uh, answer as many of those questions as possible. Apologies, Daniel. Please uh, continue. Problem. Okay. So, so yeah, we can we we can actually draw sort of outlook. Uh, macroeconomics is really absolutely crucial to the current moment of the real estate market because we really uh have changing conditions as you can see on, on on the graph with inflation and the ecb policy rates 
the rise in ECB interest rates is really quite steep, has never been uh, as, as steep as today, and we're expecting a 25 base point hike uh, at the end of, of, of June. So um, what, what we can say is that we, in my view, we are actually quite near to a tipping point, meaning that uh, we have to remember that that after the the invasion of, of Ukraine, the ECB had stated that the objective was to come back to a two percent inflation target uh, in the in the eurozone. We we we're getting closer to that, but still inflation is uh, is substantial. You can see it's decelerating. What's most interesting is that the energy component of inflation has actually shrinked and now we have what's called core inflation usual inflation of goods and services uh which which uh, i see as a sort of trickle down uh of of uh, of the former energy uh, soaring energy prices and commodity prices and actually we're seeing in the, in the US that inflation is really shrinking even faster than in the, in the in the eurozone so at the same time so so that's why i believe that we probably uh, but we'll see that we have to to uh, to count with um, at least three scenarios but uh, my personal vision is that we 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 are near to the to the peak of, uh, of of interest rates. Um, at the same time, uh, eurozone growth is actually quite resilient, uh, considering that the interest rates have have taken 400 base points in in uh, in a few months. Um, we we're not seeing a hard recession. We we rather seeing slow growth. That's because employment is holding up exceptionally well uh, and that's for demographic reasons uh, and also because uh, we, we're in an economy of services which are much less cyclical than uh, that of the you know the the stagflation, stagflation uh, episode of the end of 1970s um so so really the the um, european economy is being quite resilient which by the way is all the more encouraging for central banks to to rise interest rates because uh, inflation is still the primary concern uh today so so for real estate investors the the the, the questions that that arise are first of all is 4% uh, interest rates um, sustainable from an economic point of view, or is it just an episode to tame inflation? Uh, because if you have 4% interest rates, that means if you're a government, that when you have to 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 raise some some debt on the market, you have to pay 4%. It's, of course, can be very expensive, especially for, for some European countries, some European governments who are who have very high uh, debt to GDP ratios. So not sure it's sustainable, um, but that's under discussion, of course. The second question is, will inflation persist or will it will it go backwards? Will it, will, will it backflow? Uh, as I said, my view is that we're uh, seeing the we, we've already passed the peak of inflation, but there are other market views, and there are some reasons to believe that inflation can be sort of persistent or can can bounce back uh, because, of course, of the of the uh, the energy geopolitical situation, etc. Also because of the the fact that we've printed so much money that eventually that's going to translate into into inflation at some point. So today I would say there's still de a debate on will we see persisting inflation or was inflation just a sort of of, of episode that we 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 passing and. The third, which is actually a third question, which is actually the the to me the um, 
the re the result of the two former ones is what will valuation officers do and what anticipations will their on what anticipations will they base their valuations because uh, anticip anticipations is a very strong factor it's even more important than reality meaning that for example uh, it's often been found that that anticipations about uh, the residential market, for example, is going to determine your your behavior in terms of uh, of your relationship to liquidity. In terms of am I selling uh, am I selling my 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 asset or or, or not? And therefore, um, the the danger for real estate would be that the the anticipation of a downturn builds up uh, and, and that's even more powerful than actual reality right? anticipation. So that leads to the next slide uh, in which I try to formulate three three scenarios. Let's say you've got the the of course got the the worst case base case and, and the best case as in uh, every academic scenario. but. Let's try to see uh, on the left, you've got the, the, let's say the worst case, which would be persisting inflation. That would mean that the ECB would not diminish interest rates and will keep high interest rates uh, in order not to leave any ground to 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 inflation, not, not let it come back. That's associated, of course, with uh, low growth or even, or even recession. So that would mean that the risk premium of real estate okay the difference between uh real estate yields and uh interest rates which is the reason why investors come into real estate in the first place because there's a premium of real estate yields towards uh towards interest rates that would mean the risk premium of real estate would rebuild through falling valuations of real estate okay so basically that's downturn uh one of the signs of that is that we're in negative leverage effect okay that drives valuations down uh and as this scenario would be associated with recession we could expect that there would be at some point an impact on vacancy which would of course uh, also alter uh valuations etc so that that would be the worst case linked with persistent inflation that's the, the downturn then you've got the base case, uh, which I would affect the, the biggest probability, right? Uh, which is a backflow of inflation, which we were already seeing, and interest rates who would decline slightly, uh, possibly before the end of the year. Um, we maybe could escape a, re a recession in, in that scenario. That means that the risk premium of real estate would rebuild through declining valuations a bit, but also through uh, declining uh, interest rates. Okay, meaning that the difference between um, between uh, real estate yields and uh, interest rates would 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 become substantial uh, because of, of course, there will there will be we know and there it's already it's already showing in the market that there is a decline in valuations. But it can be a soft one, and it can be, let's say, uh, the risk premium can also be built through uh, cutting interest rates. Okay, so that's the soft landing scenario. And then there is a scenario where um, real estate comes back in the game uh, faster than than expected, uh, which would be, in my view, would be linked to liquidity events or, or just a realization that that interest rates are too high not sustainable we're already seeing of course in some banks or some financial institutions some tensions due to the level of interest rates and the the third scenario is a scenario where the emergency changes meaning that the the uh, priority becomes uh to uh let's say calm down recession risks uh or or systemic liquidity risks and therefore there's an urge 
to uh, cut down uh, interest rates by the ECB. Of course, that's possible only if inflation declines rapidly. OK, um, so, so that would be a very fast return, maybe not to negative interest rates as we saw in the last decade, but to lower interest rates because fear of recession of, or fear of uh, liquidity incidents in financial institutions or fears of uh, um, a government bond crisis like in Italy, like in Greece several years ago. Uh, if this danger becomes real, then we might uh, see the risk premium of real estate rebuilding through falling interest rates through falling bond yields more than through falling valuations. OK, and that would be the best scenario for for real estate. We should uh, in this case, we could uh, be rapidly in a position of positive leverage effect and the market would uh, reset quite rapidly. So that's the that's the best case, of course. Uh, we can't read a crystal ball. The current consensus would be rather on the soft landing, but I, th I think we should have all the options in mind uh, as an investor. Well, I was going to ask you, Daniel, I mean, if you look at the, the, the kind of forward curves and yeah. you know, where markets are predicting um, interest rates are going to, going to land, what, what's the general consensus? Uh, the general today? consensus, yeah, it's, it's on, it's on uh, interest. We, most of, of uh, commentators believe that we are seeing the last hikes in interest rates uh, mm -hmm. just now uh, in, in, in summer 2023. And then um, I would say the consensus is the beginning of cutting interest rates slowly by the end of year 2023 or the beginning of 2024. So really a slow process. And during this process, reality is there's not much investment in a real estate because most investors have a have a wait and see attitude but as as we've learned in the two to three last years what is expected uh doesn't often happen so there there can be some events very true um i'd just like to go back to this slide here um quickly uh, and you know, particularly looking at these these two graphs on on the right, um, and you know the I suppose if we follow the, the kind of traditional view, um, it certainly takes a, a while for you know policy rate changes to actually feed through um, into the uh, into the inflation figures. So I mean, typically we might expect it to take you know many months, maybe a year or yeah. or so before. You know these these increases. Now we've seen such a rapid increase here. You know, really going from zero to well, four percent probably by the end yeah. of this month. Yeah. Um, within uh, such a short period of time, within a year, um, is there a risk here? Do you think that you know perhaps the the central banks, the ECB, and, and maybe others like the the Bank of England and 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 the Fed are kind of you know, potentially going to overshoot and um, you know, I we could think... end up end up in a situation six twelve months from now where mm. uh, perhaps they've they've kind of over <laughs> overdone the the rises I, I think the overshoot is is a real risk but i also think in order to tame inflation to tamper inflation they they have to uh make the market think that they are overshooting mm -hmm. meaning that there's a speculative component to inflation too and they have to destroy this speculation that inflation could be persistent. And that, that's, that's why there's a big difference between the reality of what ECB is doing and the communication. You remember that, that at the beginning of the year, the communication of central banks w w was we could rise interest rates even higher for longer, right? They're, they're not saying that anymore, by the way. But I think, uh, as I said, ECB is not only managing reality, they are managing the anticipations, so they they have to to show a bit their teeth. Uh, they 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 have to make us fear that they are overshooting, uh, in order to to uh, to reach the the inflation target fast. So there's a kind of psychological component exactly. to this as well. Um, good. And um, I suppose one other question I did have, and maybe just going back to this this slide here I mean, one of the things you mentioned as we as we went through this was that um 
you know, one of the reasons that investors go for real estate is because there is that kind of risk premium spread, yeah. uh, you know, liquidity premium or, or um, whatever you want to call it between, you know, the, where the, the kind of debt, you know, what the, the fixed income and debt markets can produce and then, you know, what real estate can produce. I suppose the other reason or one of the other reasons that, that investors you know, go for real estate is because it has that kind of um, inflation hedging uh, capacity as well. I'm not old enough to remember uh, mm. before the last uh, GSC, I'm pretty sure we had a negative, you know, certainly in the UK, uh, I guess in Europe as well, a kind yeah. of negative spread as well. But that was predicated, I think, on the assumption that you know, rents would you know, continue to increase rapidly. Um, and uh, you know, that, that, that would you know, still produce you know, happy returns all around for everybody, which you know, as, we, as we saw which in 2007, is... 2008, didn't necessarily uh, happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is true because actually uh, inflation shows up in rents, uh, but it shows better when there's growth, right? Because of course mm -hmm. you need to have uh, solvent uh, tenants and of course manage the the uh, the financial health of of your of your tenants. But yeah, of course, I, I, even in the universe where uh, bonds deliver four uh, percent, still there's an interest for real estate because uh, it's uh, uh, theoretically more defensive against inflation because it diversifies the risk towards bonds. Okay, so a portfolio with bonds plus real estate is actually quite resilient in terms of uh, mitigation of risk uh, for institutional investors. So uh, I, I think even in the case of, let's say, soft landing, uh, there is some rational to invest in real estate for institutional investors but the rational is is not anymore uh or not yet the risk premium of of real estate it's more the diversification the mitigation of risk for uh long-term uh positions that they have on on their portfolio but there's a rebalancing between bonds and real estate in that case great well thank you very much i know we've Kind of got to okay. 20 past the hour and um, probably need to, to move on now. Um, but yeah, th thanks again for your insights there. Um, okay. I'm going to hand over now to uh, Henri Aurelien, um, who's going to talk more about the, the real estate market perspectives for 2023 across Europe. Uh, so Henri, please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Uh, so first, uh, I wanted to say that I'm very happy to be uh, with you today to present you our latest uh, analysis and market uh, perspectives. So first, when we have a look on real estate, the global uh, situation led investors to be rigorous in their allocation uh, choices during the first quarter of 2023, as you can see on uh, this slide. The wait and see attitude of uh, investors, as uh, Daniel said, had uh, for com consequence a decrease of the volume of capital uh, for the first quarter of this year. And as we can uh, see now, there is only uh, 34 um, billion euro invested in Europe. It is uh, interesting to note that the assets such as uh, Healthcare, for example, which meet ERG criteria and can generate performance through income return, are becoming very attractive uh, to investors. And it's what we are going to see on the next slide. When we have a look on the, the breakdown by, uh, um, by asset classes, uh, what we can see here and what I want to share with you, it's First, uh, the fact that offices dominated with uh, 32%, uh, followed by uh, retail and residential with uh, 20% uh, each. Then you have uh, logistic for 60%, hospitality 10%, and finally healthcare for 3%. When we have a look on yields, I think there is one point of uh, attention. It is the tightening of monetary policy because we saw some decompression for some assets uh, or for some uh, markets. So at this uh, stage, I think uh, it could be good to have a look on uh, our forecast and the link between economy that uh, Daniel uh, presents uh, us and real estate. So when we have a look on this uh, forecast, 
what I want to share with you today is uh, the fact that the European economy was uh, resilient during the first quarter of this year, but um, it was not what we can call a strong performance, but the economy was resilient. So this is uh, the first uh, good point for the economy in 2023, and we can expect uh, for the overall year something uh, not uh, so bad finally. However, the ECB has chosen once again to increase rates to control inflationary pressures during the first quarter, and we think that uh, the ECB should continue to increase uh, these uh, rates in June and uh, July. So we'll see um, in two days what the ECB is going to do. So in this context, market consensus suggests that the 10-year government, bond, uh, government bonds uh, should experience a decline when the ECB will uh, judge it necessary for the good health, I would say, of the economy. So maybe it could be in the end of this year, or if I'm very conservative, I will say in the end of the next year. So economists are suggesting that if inflation is under control, it will trigger a more accommodative key rates uh, policy, as uh, Daniel said. The acceleration of the rise in key rates by central banks to reduce inflation has led to a process of reconstitution of risk premium, of risk premium sorry, in the end of uh, last year, so in 2022, and in the beginning of this year in 2023. So I will say that at the same time, the total return, especially capital growth, was impacted by the soaring cost of debt as we anticipated. Income return was quite good uh, this year, or the beginning of this year, because of the indexation of the consumer price index in Europe, which is quite high because of the inflationary uh, pressure. When we have a look now um, for 2028, we, uh, 2028, we can uh, think that the performance is going to be drive, as we can see on this slide, by the income return more than the capital growth. So when uh, when we when we 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 have uh, this in mind, we can uh, go to the next slide and to see what could be the optimal uh, Eurozone real estate portfolio uh, for 2023 to 2028 by SMART. So here you have, I will try to explain you this slide in a, simply, a simple way. So you have different uh, hypotheses. The first one is um, the macro uh, hypothesis. So here we have a GDP around 1.2% uh, in average for the next 10 year, and inflation for 2% and uh, the 10 year government bonds around 2.5% in average for the next 10 years. The efficient portfolio hypothesis, it's a total return between, as you can see, it's very conservative, between 3 to 4.5%. The um, performance, it, it's going to be driven by the income return more than the capital growth. The countries uh, that we have in this um, portfolio, it's uh, the Eurozone. On uh, the assets, it's all uh, kind of assets like offices, retail, healthcare, residential, hospital, and clinics. Uh, here also, what I want to share with you is uh, the risk uh, that um, we consider. It's, for example, uh, um, uh, increase in bond uh, yields or will continue. Uh, and the other point, it's a big recession. So. When you have this in mind here, we try to to do to to ask what is the best portfolio for this uh, time. So to do this, we use our own portfolio uh, statistical model called SMART, as I say in the beginning. And SMART, it's able to forecast and to make projection for the next decade based on the past data, and offer unique portfolio recommendations. 
if you are looking at the best performance with the minimum of risk, smart favor healthcare because value of this asset class remain resilient and to take advantage of the retail rebounds. Because of the uncertainty of the context and the volatility of some assets, smart suggests an equal allocation between hotel, residential and logistics. And finally, SMART also recommends like, incorporating offices, but uh, the location and the attractiveness of the building will make the difference uh, for this uh, asset class. So, Alex, uh, here is uh, what I wanted to share with you uh, today. Thank you, Henri. And um, yeah, just again, a reminder to everybody, if you have questions, then please you know, do uh, submit them through the Q&A. Um, Henri, I'd just like to Kind of go back to this slide here um just for a, a couple of quick questions because I'm, I'm conscious of, of of time as well i mean we can see from this this forecast this consensus forecast that you know logistics is um looking like a, a strong performer both from a, a um, kind of income uh, and also from a, a capital perspective interesting to see the next one along the line here retail um actually showing you know pretty strong performance as well. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? You know, obviously, you know, retail over the past, you know, several years has been a little bit of, of the kind of, um, you know, less favoured uh, asset class. Um, so it's interesting to see that you know, it's actually kind of showing quite, quite strong performance. And also as a more general question, I mean, when, when these forecasts are put together, are these based on kind of Kind of core or prime assets, and particularly for retail, you know, retail is obviously a very um, you know, an asset, a sector with with lots of different subsectors. You know, whether it's high street, uh, retail parks, shopping centres, uh, whatever it might be. Um, so, kind of factors are, are brought into you know, this projection for retail, and there, are there particular subsectors which we think are going to outperform as opposed to uh, to others? Yeah, uh, just uh, here you should uh, have in mind that uh, especially retail and uh, logistic uh, uh, know uh, now some uh, volatility especially for capital growth and uh, it's uh, what uh, you can see on this uh, slide and why the performance is uh, important so uh, here i will say and it's what uh, smart say and especially for logistic it's interesting, but take care because the volatility of this asset is quite high. So it's interesting, but um, it's not what a smart say or you should uh, put in majority on your portfolio because the problem is um, the mm -hmm. volatility. Smart will say that it's interesting to have an asset who can have a good balance between risks and the performance. For example, uh, as I said, healthcare because the performance it's uh, very, um, I will say, um, the same and the volatility is not so high. For retail, I think it's uh, this asset. It's also very interesting because um, uh, it was uh, during the COVID crisis. The performance was not so good for the retail, but I think there is some opportunity and especially for the income return uh, is uh, quite uh, good for this uh, asset. So this is uh, the reason uh, why and the performance, it's, uh, it's also good um, for retail. Thank you. And then final question on this one, looking at the residential you know, projected performance as well. Um, you can see here that it, it seems to, you know, when you look at it compared with other asset classes, um, to have quite a strong kind of capital growth component um you know we could probably expect yeah income maybe to be a little bit a little bit lower given you know kind of high pricing and um you know still strong demand for these these assets from an occupational perspective um but yeah could you just provide a little bit of background on you know where that that capital growth uh, aspect is coming from is that driven by you know rental inflation or you know, what or do we expect further kind of you know, compression or you know yeah, so in general, rates. yeah, in general for uh, residential, the income return it's not uh, very high because um, there is some uh, route for this uh, asset. 
uh, it's not like uh, commercial real estate. So the income return, it's uh, always, especially for example in France, the income return, it's not so so important because there is some uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. But in general, because um, the demand is quite high, the, there is a pressure on capital growth and it's what uh, we see here. It's always uh, quite uh, well oriented for residential. Of course, there is, as you can see, the forecast here, it's for 2024 to 2028. So we don't have um, 2023 and there is, a, we can get some uh, pressure on the capital growth uh, for residential, but we know that for residential, mm -hmm. when the, um, the selling part will start, because there is uh, some um, private uh, um, investor, uh, and also a big company. We know that uh, when the um, private investor will uh, uh, will uh, start uh, the selling process, the the capital growth uh, will continue to improve uh, in a good way. Great. So here is what we can see. Well, th thank you very much, Henri. Um, it was fascinating, welcome. and um, yeah, love to chat more. But I think we have to move on. A little bit further into the um into the presentation now and, and one of the, the asset classes one of the sectors here on this chart is is healthcare which again is is um you know showing what we would expect to be perhaps above uh the general kind of performance level uh, and we've got our head of healthcare and education jan uh, balayi uh, here to uh talk to us specifically about the healthcare sector so i'm going to move on to um this part of the uh of, of the webinar and jan if i could hand over to you perhaps to uh, um, yeah, introduce this topic for us. Yes, with, um, with pleasure. I think that we can start with a, a very quick overview of the, of the actual trends of the, of the market in terms of uh, volume of investment. As uh, Daniel already said, of course, in Europe, there is a decrease of all the investment vo volume in each asset class. And uh, I would say that in healthcare, it's the same. We see that the drop is between uh, less than 40 to less than 50 percent for for q1 2023 even if uh, we continue to see um, uh, transaction on the market and everywhere in europe uh, we have uh, already performed uh, for uh, funds managed by prem uh, transaction uh, in the acute care segment in france in the nursing home in Germany for, for Q1 2023. We have seen also other investment from also other institutional investors uh, in Italy on the nursing home sectors, in Spain in the nursing home sector. So we continue to see uh, a, a very positive trend in terms of transaction uh, in, the, uh, in this uh, asset class uh, uh, sector. Uh, we can also mention that the, the, the year 2023, even if the volume of the transaction will be a little bit uh, or will be lower than, 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 than the past years, uh, they will be also, it will be also a particular uh, year because uh, we should be able to, uh, to close our transaction uh, that we are working on on the uh, portfolio ICAT Santé uh, during 2023, uh, which is uh, represent a volume of asset under management of a little bit more than 6 billion euros. So it will be, uh, 2023 will be a particular year on this, uh, on this, um, on this perspective. Um, I think that on the next slide, we, what we should also mention is that uh, uh, we need to be uh, um, more and more cautious about uh, the profitability of the operator because, um, as you uh, may already know, when you invest in the healthcare sector, in the real estate, you also invest in the business plan of the operator, and you have to be sure that this business plan is sustainable for the operator to have the capacity to sustain his activity and to have the capacity to face all his uh, uh, charges, uh, especially the, the, the rent. Um, after COVID, I think that we have uh, seen a very good recovery uh, of all the uh, uh, operative operational uh, figures. So there was no uh, uh, huge damage, I would say, in the different sectors, even if you are talking about the acute care or the long stay or the, the, the mid stay uh, uh, sector. Right now, we can mention that in Germany, especially, uh, there, there is uh, more problem uh, uh, for the operator facing 
Uh, it's especially due to a new legislation that has started in the beginning of 2022 that asks for the operator to increase the number of staff. So a part of the inflation, of the indexation, of the uh, increase of the of the uh, of the cost for energy, for instance, that every operators and every actors in, in, in the real estate market are facing, uh, German operators are also facing uh, 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 more cost in terms of, of, of staff. We do consider that it's only temporary and that normally in the next months, uh, 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 profitability of the operator should uh, uh, come back uh, uh, stable with uh, an increase of the po possibility to increase sorry, the, the income of the operator through different uh, subsidies. On other countries and other uh, asset class uh, sector, we see very positive trends. We can mention, for instance, the acute care sector segment in France uh, with the benefit of uh, a huge, uh, big increase of the tarification uh, for the private operator of more than 5% that has been decided uh, for, by, by, by the new financial legislation that gives the possibility for the operator, small or bigger uh, private operator, to pass on the inflation, the indexation, uh, etc. So when we are discussing with those operators, we see that the beginning, the start at the Q3 is uh, uh, good, uh, even uh, for some uh, very good in terms of trends of, uh, of activity, which give us uh, the confidence of the possibility to pass on the indexation uh, and to stabilize the valuation of the uh, of the of our stock of, uh, of real estate. Um, and and to, to, to discuss a little bit about the, the, the market trends, in terms of valuation, we see that in for Q1 and Q2, uh, what we expect for Q2 2023, it's uh, a stabilization of the valuation of our stock, uh, obviously mainly uh, driven by the, by the positive impact of the indexation, but also to the fact that uh, if there is a slight decrease uh, of the of the of the cap rate, uh, this is uh, much more limited than you can see in other uh, in other asset class, like for instance, uh, office. So, for instance, if you are talking about long stay uh, in France or in Spain or in Italy, you see a decrease of between 25 to 30 business points on the cap rate. And for the acute care segment in France, as I already highlighted, that benefit of, very, of a very positive trends, there is even no uh, a decrease of the, of, the, of the prime yield for this kind of, uh, of uh, asset class. So yeah, um, so sorry, when, when you talk about decrease, you mean like a, a yield expansion? Yeah, exactly. Um, yep. If we if we want to take some some number, uh, mm -hmm. uh, prime yields uh, in a long stay in France was uh, six months ago uh, around uh, four to four point twenty uh, uh, percent, and now uh, it's uh, between four point twenty five to four point forty. Uh, mm -hmm. In Germany, the 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 decrease has been a, a little bit higher when the prime yield was uh, mid 2022 uh, around four percent even less than four percent and now it's more between 4.5 to 4.6 percent but you see uh, uh, as I said a decrease that is lower than for the other other asset class mm -hmm. in, in terms of of uh, new trends or, or actual trends. Um, as you as you know, at Primonial REM, we say that we invest in all the spectrum of the asset class from short stay to, uh, to long stay. Uh, we, we also have a, an interest to focus on our, our investment on what we call the, the healthcare with proximity, which is more and more a, a, a challenge for all the countries, is to have the capacity to offer uh, uh, um, uh, assets uh, with doctors uh, for uh, all the people inside big cities, but also outside. There is actually a, a, a debate in France about this and the, 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 the willingness of the, um, of, the, of the policies to increase the number of medical offices buildings everywhere in, uh, in, in France. And this is also a trend that we will recognize in the private operator that want also to continue to develop this healthcare for uh, with uh, with uh, with proximity. 
Um, we can also uh, mention the fact that senior housing and new models of senior housing, like for instance, co-living uh, mm -hmm. for seniors, so it's a smaller uh, uh, units in terms of, of real estate, is continue to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to be driven as a, as a positive trend because obviously of the needs that we repeat at every webinar, but uh, uh, with the increase of the elderly people that we are facing for 2030 and, and 2050, there is a need of creation, uh, of new models and of new real estate in order to take care about the, uh, the elderly people. Fantastic. Thank you, Jan. I know we're, we're, we're sort of coming towards the end of the uh, yep. of the allotted time for the webinar. Before we, we ended, I did just want to bring in, in Daniel as well into this conversation as well, just on the, the topic of ESG um, and, uh, and and healthcare. You know, these assets, you know, when you think about you know, typical long stay assets, what we refer to as long stay, i.e. kind of nursing home type assets, Sometimes these these types of assets can probably be quite energy intensive in terms of, yes. you know, particularly during the winter months. Maybe not today, but um, you know, during a lot of the year, the heating ha you know, should be you know, kept on. The the lighting, the um, you know, utilities that are, that are being used. Um, how important is you know, kind of sustainability and factor in um, you know, this 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 sector and 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 what kind of things are you know, what is the market and, and, and us at Promonia RM doing to help yeah. improve the sustainability of these uh, of these assets? Yeah, it's actually it's actually quite a challenge to uh, to um, let's say develop the the ESG uh, features of of uh, healthcare real estate because uh, as you mentioned, these are assets who function twenty four hours around the clock, um, seven days a week with vulnerable people. Uh, also, we have a, a lease structure, triple net lease structure, which leaves to the tenants most of the uh, of the work. So there, there are things, and so therefore they are quite energy intensive. So there are some, some actions we can do. Uh, solar panels, typically, uh, if we have a roof, which is uh, Adequate, we can and we 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 develop this in uh, in Spain or, or other countries. Um, there's a big work to be done on isolation, okay. And the biggest challenge is to I would say electrify uh, healthcare real estate, meaning going out from 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 gas uh, mm -hmm. every time we we can. So. There's no magic formula to to refurbish uh, healthcare real estate. By the way, you can't can't perform any time of capex, any any kind of capex, because of course we you, you can't just um, uh, evacuate people from from uh, from a clinic or, or from a nursing home. But um, you, you, our view is we have to provision these capex at acquisition stage take the time to to deploy them every year because if we we make it uh, if we if we uh, deploy these kind of actions uh, all at once at the end and uh, because valuation offices uh, uh, suddenly uh, suddenly take them into account uh, it's not going to be good so so we want to have a systematic best in progress approach uh, and of course, that means reconsidering the partnership with operators, meaning that we, and, and I think it, at Primonial Rem, we have the unique possibility to really have a balanced uh, relationship with uh, operators and therefore uh, find agreements as we already have to, to um, really integrate ESG in the business model and the valuation model of healthcare real estate. And today there's an incentive to do so because of energy bills, mm -hmm. which are soaring, going through the roof for, for those uh, for those uh, operators. So it's, uh, it's um, as I often say, it's a um, uh, case by case approach, right? And every asset is different, uh, but it's a systemic kind of uh, of a, of approach uh, uh, and and uh, therefore we we with Jan, we work uh, a big deal to integrate ESG in a 10 year business plan for every uh, asset we have 
Super. Thank you, Dan. And it seems to me, yeah, like as you said, it's a real kind of partnership approach yeah. with the uh, with with the tenants, the operators of the assets as well. Uh, that's why there's a big advantage for big players in uh, because of course mm -hmm. there are some big operators. It's an oligopoly fundamentally, and uh, therefore big landlords have to establish this standard partnership with big operators in order to influence the market in a positive impact way. Super. Well, thank you. I've, I've, I think we're, we're kind of well over our, our time now, so we're probably going to have to bring the webinar uh, to an end, unfortunately. Um, I think we could probably talk on these topics uh, for much, much longer. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you. Uh, well, firstly, to our speakers, uh, Daniel, Jan, Henri, Henri Lien. Uh, thank you again uh, for being here today. Um, thank you to everybody who has attended. Um, just to let you know that the slides, I, I think, will be available after the, uh, after the session. Um, and also, if you do have any uh, questions um, that you'd like the, the panel to address, please do feel free uh, to send them in to us. Uh, I think it's uh, communication at uh, promoniarim.com. Uh, and uh, finally, just to mention that yeah, we do have a, a, a wealth of resources on our website under Insights, um, including latest uh, healthcare uh, um, research reports, uh, our real estate convictions reports, there is a, a new podcast uh, which has recently been uh, recorded. Um, uh, Jan has uh, featured on the first one, uh, and that could be found on uh, a number of different uh, you know, podcast providers. Uh, and um, yeah, there's, there's plenty more as well, also on our social media uh, uh, platforms uh, as well. Um, so with that, uh, just like to uh, say thank you again. Uh, uh, wishing you all a, a, a great day and um, hope to see you again soon at the uh, at the next webinar. Goodbye. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. Alex.